I am here with our staff developer, Ms. Kristen Spang, and we are about to talk about our new teacher expert series designed to, to help inexperienced and new teachers learn from their experienced peers and also to help established teachers learn from their colleagues as well. Kristen, who are we kicking this series off with today? We are actually here at Dixie Hollins with Ms. Jody Lynn Henderson. Um, we are lucky to have her in our teacher expert series. It really is truly giving teachers an opportunity to see firsthand what's happening in the classroom from one of their peers. So I think it's just a wonderful experience for them to have. We're going to basically break it up into three sections. We're going to talk about like engagement and some things that I found. And I want to kind of focus a little bit on argumentative writing. A lot of English teachers are kind of at that place getting ready for the FSA. Um, and so, oh, yay. Um, and then we're going to talk about also um, organization and kind of like some grading ideas and how to make grading a little bit easier and um, getting kids to have all their supplies and kind of being prepared for class and how you can be organized as well and then also just processes and just some practices that I've learned to put into place from my first few years of teaching when it was pretty rough. So tell me what was the pivotal moment that led to you having a focus on classroom processes? Um, my second year was really when I decided that I needed to get a handle on that. It was a pretty rough year for me. Um, I had a lot of um, what felt like disengagement and um, I felt very frustrated. I was going home upset a lot. And so I, I was very lucky to have good mentors. I had a couple of people here that um, are still good friends of mine that I talked to. and. Um, you know, they were pretty mm -hmm. decent classroom managers. And, and so I started thinking, well, it's all about the processes. They don't really know what I'm expecting. They don't really know, like, where am I getting frustrated? And I would find that where I'm getting frustrated is the exact points where there's a breakdown in my expectation of them and what they're delivering for me. So there's something missing there. And so I just started focusing on one little thing at a time. And one of the first things that I did was I started kind of like reflecting and journaling a little bit. And so that's kind of something I'm gonna have you do really quickly. I think it's something that helps a lot when you're first trying to figure out what you want and where you're going. I'm gonna have you do a quick write. I do this with my students all the time. Quick writes are timed writings. It's usually three to four, well, sometimes five minutes. It's usually much shorter than that, though three minutes is usually what I do and I just have them write and the idea behind a quick write is you just are writing the whole three minutes or four minutes and you just keep going and it's kind of teaching them a little bit more of stream of consciousness right like if they're like oh I don't know what to write you literally are writing I don't know what to write what we what I personally feel I'm noticing with Common Core is that and I think other teachers are too there's a little bit of a loss of their ability to find their own voice in their writing because it is very formulaic. It's very, you know, we started when we rolled this out, it was very find evidence to support what you're thinking and get everything from the text. And so they're just losing a little bit of their, what is your opinion about it? How do you feel about it? Give me an example from your own brain, like rather than something from the text, like think about it. What are you trying to say when you're finding this piece of evidence? What is that supporting? Use what they have and think and find their voice a little bit. And some of them might find that they're more humorous in their writing or that they're more serious in their writing. So it's just a way to get them to be more comfortable writing without having something to fall back on, like a piece of text. What do you want your ideal classroom to be like? I think that's a really important thing. You can't get somewhere if you don't know where you're going or what you would like to see. And so I want you to kind of just consider like, what are your students doing? What are your relationships like with your students? What does your room feel like? Is it kind of like this or like a little bit calmer? Is it more active groups? Is it more independent work? So what are you kind of hoping to get to eventually at some point? What were the three things that you were hoping to help teachers with during your training? So we broke the training down to um, engagement because I think that's just a natural thing. If the kids are engaged, everything goes smoother. Everything is easier. Um, and then organization, if you are having or feeling overwhelmed with things like getting their papers back to them, grading papers, feeling overwhelmed, it affects how it's gonna go for you in the classroom. And then processes, which is my main thing. I love classroom processes. And so simple things that make a big difference, like how often are you writing a restroom pass? And if you feel like you're doing that all the time, it takes away from your ability to focus on content and just feel better in your 
presentation of what you're doing. So those three areas, engagement, organization, and processes. So we're gonna get into strategies that would help engage, and these are just some things that I've used. Um, we're gonna talk about basically five things, creative writing, bell work, avid strategies, um, that I think really, really help in an English environment. And then small grouping and turning and talking, some graphic organizers and exemplars of writing and kind of the importance of that, especially with Common Core, and then accountability and holding students accountable so that they're more on task. Um, the first thing is creative writing bell work. Um, one big thing with Common Core um, that I have noticed since it's been out is a lot of our students are becoming very, very good at just repeating information that they already have in front of them. And they're kind of losing in the process their voice and their ability to actually write just for the purpose of writing. And so you're starting to see kind of these paragraphs if you've had them write an essay yet or even just short responses that are very like one or two little sentences that belong to them and all the rest is text-based evidence. And they're really losing like, and, and that's actually not going to help them on the FSA. They need to be able to write an opinion without saying like, in my opinion, and express themselves and have thoughts about things and the evidence is backing that up, not the other way around. And I think we're, I think a lot of people that are leading Common Core are starting to see that, but at the same time, it's a problem that we're facing. Um, kids that have been hearing it now for several years are really lacking their ability to write well just on their own. And so one thing that I do, I strongly recommend if you do not have bell work, that you have bell work. It is a lifesaver. My bell work, and if you don't do creative writing, I mean, whatever, as long as, in my opinion, it serves these three purposes. Bell work should have them get their materials. They should have all of their materials before the bell rings. They should be ready to rock and roll. It shouldn't even be an issue for you. And if you give them something to do where they're writing, that is very helpful because they already have to have their writing utensil, they already have to have a sheet of paper or a notebook or whatever you have them using. So I strongly recommend having some sort of written bell work, especially in English. Um, they need to be in their seat. And then the other thing that I think bell work helps with is just to kind of calm them down and get them into classroom mode. If there was a fight in the hall or something happened at lunch or whatever, it kind of just like switches their mindset a little bit. And my kids are allowed to talk, you know, it's not a silent thing, but a lot of them are very quiet. A lot of them kind of just become silent because they're trying to get it done. Um, so creative writing for me I think is very helpful. It can also, you can find a million slides. I mean, go online and Google it. There are just millions of options that are already pre-made so it doesn't become another thing that you have to create all the time, which was a, a big deal for me. I was like, I don't wanna just have to think about bell work now and add another thing. So I strongly recommend that you do creative writing. You can throw in argumentative prompts in there. Um, I did one the other day, like should prisoners have the right to vote? And they got really into that and they wrote about, and that's good, that's what we want them to be doing in argumentative writing. You don't have a text in front of you, but what do you think? You have thoughts. You're smart people. You can think on your own. And so those are kind of some of the things you can do with um, creative so writing. So I think a big thing with engagement is natural, and then sometimes it just has to be forced if they're doing something that isn't that entertaining or fabulous. And I think class discussions are great. Mixing for natural engagement, right? Like um, philosophical chairs, Socratic seminars, a lot of avid strategies focus on getting them to talk to one another. Um, and so I think that those things are powerful because they like to talk. They like to hear themselves talk and they like to express their opinions and talk to each other. So anytime that you can have class discussions that are productive and that have rules and, you know, are kind of set up. Um, mixing up, I try to mix up between having, um, you know, independent work. Sometimes it needs to be independent. Sometimes you need to read by yourself and just process it alone. Sometimes they need to be doing things with just a partner where too, a group is too much. So mixing it up. Sometimes it's group, sometimes it's partner and trying to like create activities that mix up how the day goes it, for their sake and, and for my sake. I'm big on accountability. They, I, marking, just marking the text is really not enough for me. I believe that they need to be taking notes. And what dialectical journaling is, is it's basically um, like two column notes. So you would take your sheet of paper and fold it in half long ways. And on the left side, they have a quote from the text. And you're the teacher, you can make it 10 quotes, you can make it five quotes, however long the text is. So they literally are just copying down quotes that they get out of the text that they find valuable. 
And on the other side, on the right side, is their personal response to it. So they can ask a question. It's something that is confusing them. Um, they can make a prediction. So this is kind of, oh, where I think this is going to go. They can have like a little like Oprah aha moment, right, where they're like, oh, I totally get that. That makes sense to me now. And basically, I just put up an example for them on the um, Elmo, and I kind of model it. I show them like a quote from the text and then my personal response so they get an idea of what I'm expecting. You could also even write on there what the responses could be. Um, this is another thing I recommend. I recommend turning and talking several times during the class period. Um, I think it's the statistic is like what, 10 minutes of taking in is about all they can handle. I wasn't sure if it was eight or 10, but 10 minutes of taking in and then they need two minutes to process what's happening or they're gonna start getting lost. Especially if you have a lot of ESE kids, they need to have a minute and process what's going on. They also need to hear other people of their age explain what's going on, right? Sometimes you giving it to them all the time is intense for them. This year I started doing like work spot checks, um, which is a really good thing. Because the big thing with accountability and teachers, I found is if it's too complicated, they, they don't do it. If their process is too much, it's, it, they're, they're gonna fall, yeah, it's gonna fall through and they're just not gonna do it. And understandably so. I mean, they have to do it repeatedly over and over again throughout the day. So work spot checks are great because you don't have to do it. If you're like, oh man, I do not feel like walking around this classroom right now, you don't have to do it. But if you're seeing that there's some that are off task, you can be like, okay, we're doing a spot check and it's five points or however you wanna do it. And um, that has worked, or the opposite, if somebody who is normally having a hard time, they're doing well, it gives you an opportunity to catch them doing something you know, the right way and give them credit for that. So um, I think that spot checks have been a, a lifesaver for me. It's helped a lot because they never know when it's coming. So it forces them to be a little bit more on the ball. And then I do something called seat bingo, which is a version of popsicle sticks. I mean, a lot of teachers do little popsicle sticks with names on it. I do bingo balls with seat numbers. Yeah, I actually and noticed. My, that, yep, this right, is it. Right here, seat bingo. This is it, <laughs> seat bingo. And I basically just like do that and pick a number out and they, they know where their seat is because I have my desk in rows and you could do it with tables. I mean, you could do it any way that you want. Um, but that's another way to, you know, have them speak about what, you know, or share out loud with what they just read or what they just heard with a partner or doing turn and talk. Turn and talk is another big thing. I try to, whenever I do see bingo, I try to have them turn and talk first to give them a little bit of comfort. Like they shared their answer or their response with somebody else and they kind of feel a little bit better sharing it with the group. Well, I talk about like discipline a little bit um, in here. Um, I'm a big fan of, just to kind of talk about it briefly here and then I'll give you some more stuff, but I'm a big fan of like, pulling aside, you know, punish in private, praise in public, um, having a conversation. And one thing I'm gonna talk about is always assume the best, like what is going on? What is happening? Is something going on at home? Are you sick when they have their head down? Are you okay? And then um, have a private conversation. I always give them an option also. I have to say, I rarely write referrals, but if they refuse to work, I send them out. I believe that that is contagious. <laughs> So if one is sitting there doing nothing, the worst thing that you can do, that student, and I don't want this to sound bad, but that student is no longer the concern. The concern is everybody else. And you know, you're teaching to the majority. And so if that student needs to leave for defiance, then boom, see ya. And so that way, the, the and the thing of it is, is I remember, um, now I'm a little bit better about kind of getting that in the beginning, but when I first started, it took a little while to build that culture. Like you sit here and you do nothing and I've asked you to do something, you're out of here. And so eventually they will start to adjust. Um, I know it sounds easier than it is, but it, yeah, overwhelming. I was really, when I first started, I was really hesitant to do grouping because it was like a loss of control for me. And um, I kind of felt like they were instantly getting off task, but this is just, um, kind of to help you, I think, guide keeping them on task a little bit better. Sometimes they will get off task. The best advice I can give you is walk around. You just gotta be fluid. You gotta be moving around, you gotta be paying attention, carry a clipboard, even if you're not, mar I faked it before. I've carried a clipboard and just been like, and just faked it because I'm like, I'm just having a day and they think I'm marking it and you know, it works. I mean, the more you're moving, the better they do. Um, but this is kind of some advice. I found that one, groups should have time limitations always. Don't just let, and I know that that sounds like a basic thing, but break up everything you're giving them to do. I mean, literally every task, give them the smallest time constraint that you can, because then they feel like there's less of an opportunity to get off task. Okay, you have 10 minutes to get this done. Even if you're kind of like, I know that it's gonna take them longer than that. Give them less time, it helps them stay in the task at hand. 
I believe that every single one of them has to have some sort of independent accountability. They should all be writing. There should not be a note taker. You all need to be writing. You should all be getting this information. I have you in groups for a reason. They should all be held accountable for that. That way, if there's one kid not participating, they can the ones that are working can still get their grade. And then they should all also have a speaking accountability. They should all be speaking. And basically what I do is it's almost like a, a gotcha, right? Like I'm just looking around the room, I'm walking, and I just need to see you speaking. And I don't tell them when I'm gonna see it, they don't know when I'm gonna see it, I need to see them speaking. And I'm like, if you're talking regularly, if you continue to participate, I will see you. If you talk one time, there's a chance I won't see you and you won't get your points. So that's kind of a, and then obviously positive interactions, just as the teacher, you wanna look out for that. Is there somebody that isn't really um, feeling comfortable? Is there somebody that's maybe getting like bullied a little bit? You wanna keep your groups as positive as you can. Um. A little thing on graphic organizers. I again, I'm in. Um, a lot of us are in um, argumentative writing right now in the English classes. So I included this for you. Hopefully you grabbed it. It's an argumentative writing outline, um, and basically it's just a graphic organizer. If you haven't um, done an essay with your kids because you know because you're new and you're getting comfortable with it, outlining is a huge thing. They they really. Unfortunately, it's getting better with Common Core, but we have kids that don't see the value in planning their writing. And there's academic writing, and then there's writing for enjoyment. And in academic writing, you have to plan. I have never written an essay in college where I didn't plan something, you know, or a paper in college where I didn't have some sort of plan. Even if it was on, on a sheet of paper and it was just sloppy little quick notes to myself, they have to plan. And with the scoring on FSA, they look for that. They look for structure. They look that they have a thesis and it follows through. And so one thing that I do that I found has helped with engagement, because, just a little side note, kids get off task for two reasons. One, they're mimicking. So they're seeing that behavior elsewhere and they're like, oh, I can get away with that. That's why I always remove, right? You can't get away with that. That's not okay. I can't control this kid, but I'm gonna do my best to control the majority. The other reason is they don't know what the heck they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. So they start getting, and I know that goes back to the basics of college, right? And at first you're kind of like, yeah, right, there's other reasons, but that really is the heart of it. They're confused, they don't understand it, they didn't understand the directions. So think about this, some of the off-task behaviors you say, even turning and talking and trying to get information, and you're kind of like, I just explained that, right? But it's, they're confused. So I found with outlining, this helps them a lot. If you get to the point where you're getting there with outlining or you're gonna work on it even after the FSA because you're kind of new and you're just gonna try it out, it gives them a thesis block. They have to have a claim statement, right? Like a sentence where they're basically anchoring their paragraph. They have to have their text-based evidence. It really helps them to already have that kind of in a graphic organizer. Okay. You so you mentioned that um, you had this pivotal moment in, or this pivotal year yeah. per se. Several months. <laughs> that, pivotal several months. That led you mm -hmm. to um, to really focusing in on classroom processes. Mm -hmm. What were some of the avenues that you took to introduce yourself to these processes? Mm -hmm. Well, one of the main things was uh, having a mentor mm -hmm. and having somebody, and it wasn't like some, I mean, we do have mentor programs in Pinellas County, but that wasn't really what it was. It was just finding somebody that I had down the hallway and I would have moments where I would go into his room and be crying and be upset and um, he was very helpful he had he had been in my situation a few years before Jacob Colosi is his name and um, he was he would just give me some advice and um, kind of suggestions of what he would do and I would kind of try them and I would be able to talk some things out you know that's one big thing with teachers is that sometimes we know that something is wrong and we just need to talk it out we just need to work through it and so that was a big thing with having a, a mentor or somebody that I just kind of trusted um, so that's a big one and then another thing was um, and every school is different, but I had a very supportive administrative team, especially, um, I mean, now, but then when I first started, I had an assistant principal who I was close with, and she always recommended that I went into other people's rooms, and I saw what was going on in classrooms that were working well, and um, that was something that I think is huge. We're very, as much as there's so many teachers, we're very isolated. You know, we only kind of see what's going on in our classrooms, and sometimes, you know, we're hearing that things are going great and maybe they're not, or we're hearing that things are so bad, but maybe they're not that bad. And so I think it's important to watch right. other teachers doing what they do. So that actually is a fantastic point, and that's what we're hoping to accomplish with our teacher um, expert was, series, is that teachers from all, mm -hmm. all out the district can come in and see what is happening in another teacher's classroom 
classroom because it is so important. I mean, you mentioned that that was one of the things that really helped mm -hmm. guide you along so that you could in fact become an expert in mm -hmm. this area. Can you speak a little bit more to that? Um, well, I think that, you know, I talked to some teachers around here and, and um, work side by side with teachers around here and that's always good conversation but as far as the training went you know like newer teachers that haven't had um, a lot of experience one thing that we did at the training um, was we did like a little posty note chart where they put down feedback of what they wanted to get out of the training and then they put down as they left what they did get out of it and the, the results and kind of like how they felt when they were leaving and a lot of people said that they felt they got things that they could actually implement which is I think the whole point I mean when you go to trainings I always feel like if I go to a training and I walk away with something I can use the next day um, it was worth my time it was beneficial and I think a lot of them got that you know it's not these big huge ideas a lot of it's just simple little things that you can start doing one thing at a time so because every single day there is something that my kids know how to do they come in they know exactly what is expected it's there's no questions it hasn't deviated at all there's nothing different they know exactly what's happening and they can all do it a teacher um, almost like a teacher evolution uh, um, I was like, okay, I can deal with that the teacher series. And as a new teacher, I think that is so important. Um, I come from a training background. I'm a trainer. So um, for me, it's always you tug at the heart. Um, and that's the easiest way to get the people will learn. Um, and with the students, it's the same thing. Uh, so I think this, this allows me to be more confident in that. Yeah. What brought you to tonight's session? Um, I just want to like get a better understanding of basically English and how it functions in general. <laughs> so have you found any of tonight's strategies ready to implement when you actually return to your classroom tomorrow? Yeah, I like a bunch of the things that she has mentioned today. Um, I like the setup of her classroom. So like things like the goals and the standards, I'm like looking for something to kind of mimic in my classroom so I know going in tomorrow I'm gonna redo my board and try and get everything functional there. Excellent. It's nice to hear other people's ideas and um, their different take on maybe something that you're doing but they're doing it better or doing it differently. It might work better. Mm -hmm. So um, what is your ultimate goal? leaving here tonight. Is there something that you're hoping to really make a shift with tomorrow in your classroom that you're feeling you might be ready to do tomorrow? Um, I like both of those ideas for the, um, the discussion and uh, the journaling. Um, it's kind of a different spin on something I've tried that didn't quite work like I wanted it to. So. Mm -hmm try her way and see if it works a little bit. I, I'm just looking for a perspective from an experienced teacher. What actually brought you here tonight? What is your what is your goal for the evening? I moved from my husband's job. Um, so I'm now in my third county in three years. So going from county to county, you find different counties want different structure or they're looking for different things. So I like to go to the trainings because then I get a better understanding of what other teachers are doing, what's working, the demographic changes as well. So that's the main reason why I like to go to the trainings. It's because I can understand the county better and how to use different skills and strategies that may not have worked at a different grade level at the next grade level that I'm at. So even though you've been in the classroom for nine years, have you found any new ideas or have you heard any new methods tonight that you're interested in actually using in your classroom? Um, yes, I'm going to try the, um, the philosophical tables again. Um, maybe not with my freshmen yet, um, but definitely with my juniors, they've definitely matured over the past few months and I think they're ready to move into that area where they won't verbally attack each other. <laughs> so are you finding it helpful to learn from a teacher, colleague, a peer? Absolutely. Um, I think that having another teacher present is helpful because they're they're doing the same work that, that we're doing, so they know where we're coming from, um, they're not removed from the classroom, they're in there every day, and so they know what works and what doesn't. Thank you for joining us. We hope that you enjoyed that. For the entire lesson, please go to Inside the PCS Classroom. We're really excited about this Teacher Expert Series. We hope you are too. Please stay tuned for more. I am Jennifer Duda. I'm Kristen Spang. We'll, we'll see, see you next time. time.